awkward. Oh, there we go. Welcome to the Carolina Weather Group. As you can tell, it's already off to a fantastic start. Uh, we uh, welcome you tonight on this Thanksgiving Eve, uh, Wednesday, uh, November 22nd, 2017, slightly after 8.15. So uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And if you're listening on the podcast, uh, thank you for listening as well. So uh, this is the Carolina Weather Group. We have Jamie Morrow on li- Morrow on with us tonight. Uh, he's going to be talking about the new uh, severe weather uh, test bed, kind of a, a new uh, system that broadcast meteorologists are uh, getting to go through and see how uh, severe weather warnings are issued. So I think Ricky has uh, taken place with that. And so Jamie's going to explain the process and Ricky will kind of tell you his experience behind uh, the test bed. So uh, we look forward to that. If you are watching tonight on our live broadcast, you may be watching on Periscope or Facebook Live or watching on the YouTube page, uh, many different outlets. Uh, feel free to interact with us if you want. Uh, you can tweet us at Carolina WX, or you can leave us a comment on the Periscope or the Facebook Live page. And if you're listening to the podcast or watching the YouTube video later on, we'll let Jamie uh, share his uh, social media account information towards the end of the show. So if you have a question for him, uh, you can uh, submit those there. So I guess that's about it. Uh, we do want to wish everyone a, a happy Thanksgiving. And uh, if you're watching on the YouTube broadcast right now, uh, you're probably seeing uh, James travel throughout the southeast. We hear he's trying to hunt down the MARTA bus. We'll get more clarification with that here in just a little bit. But before we do that, let's head up to uh, let's head up to Philly tonight. Uh, a little bit cooler up there. And uh, Peter, how's things going in the uh, the Philly area tonight? Very, very good. Uh, just a little on the chilly side, though. It's uh, been kind of cool around here lately. We haven't had a very warm November. Uh, only the beginning of this month was in the 60s and 70s. But now we've been spoiled with the 40s and 50s and wind chills and even some snow up in eastern Pennsylvania and North Jersey. So it's, uh, it's that time of the year again, getting into that horrible time of year that I can't stand. But uh, it is what it is. That's the Northeast for you. But uh, to give you a little glimpse of what it's been like around here the past couple of weeks. There's been some awesome sunsets around here. I mean, just the perfect amount of cloud cover with these storm systems exiting uh, gives you these great colors. And uh, it's been, this was from, uh, I think, uh, two nights ago or last night. So it's been really, really nice around here for some good pictures. So if any photographers out there uh, need some uh, pictures, go ahead, come up to Philly and uh, get some good sunsets and sunrises too. We've had a couple of good, uh, things of that uh also before i go i want to say that uh we have a special food item here tonight <laughs> as always we always mention cinnabon on here we always have to give them a shout out because they're always so nice to us on twitter so uh yes here let, let's open this up real fast look at that mm. doesn't that just make your calorie spike that that's nicer than those sunsets let's be honest yes it is it's it's nice to have one during a sunset is there anything in the tap for the icing though uh, no. Peter, we, we need smell-o-vision. We need to be able to smell that. Yeah, I, I wish I could. Yeah. It smells sure. good as a... Maybe Sherry can make our olfactory senses kick in here somehow. <laughs> Pretty sure Peter takes his girlfriends out on dates to watch the sunset and eat Cinnabon. I mean, what, can you, yeah. I mean, what more could you ask for? I mean, that's, that's pretty good right there. And while you're at it, uh, Peter, we appreciate those nice, unfiltered uh, sunsets. They look good yes. up there. So... Thank you for that. Let's go down. Uh, let's get down the mountains and uh, to the coast. We'll bring in Jared, who is in Charles tonight. Jared, how is uh, things in the uh, low country? Wet, dry, and then wet again tomorrow. Uh, another coastal low is going to ride up and uh, and give us a little bit of a nice Thanksgiving for watching football and uh, waking up late. So it should be a nice uh, kind of wet and raw day tomorrow but you know that's okay you can't have you can't win them all you can't have 80 degrees every year i suppose um got 69 today 73 yesterday so we've been running a little bit warm uh but back down to the upper 50s tomorrow after or after uh, uh rain comes through and low pressure rides up along the coast and you know and you know just socks us in so but not too bad otherwise you know it, relatively boring you know we've only had two days of measurable rain this month the ninth and then yesterday so uh pretty dry but that's to be expected this time of year for uh charleston area so so far so good you know so you know back to you scotty all right jared we appreciate it so i guess for those who are going black friday shopping it, it you might want to bring the umbrella with you 
if you're in the Charleston area. So let's uh, go over the mountain. Let's uh, bring in Ricky Matthews. Ricky, I'll let you kind of talk about the weather, and then we'll come back to you later on so you can uh, bring in Jamie. All right. Yeah, I've been pretty calm here. We started off yesterday in the 60s, and then we dropped down today. With highs only in the 40s, uh, upper 40s, I should say. It's uh, going to be kind of a cool Thanksgiving, a little bit below average. Uh, otherwise, we've been remaining pretty calm and kind of have been calm and will be calm for the next couple of days. It does look like it's have a cool Thanksgiving, a little bit below average. Uh, echo. Oh, I'm explain the process and Rick. Sorry, y'all. I was watching the uh, YouTube broadcast and I heard voices again. So, anyways, <laughs> uh, thank you for that, Ricky. It does look like a calm period. Let's bring in. What well, is he back? James, can you hear us? I think James has been hit by a wedge. Uh, we should have taken his <laughs> stream. Went too far south, I think. He, oh gosh. He he went too far south. He crossed into South Carolina, and things yeah. happened there. He he was in Cleveland County, and then boom, it all went dark. So, all right, we'll see if we can get James's feedback here in just a minute. But let's go over to Shay Gibson. Shay, uh, we've already talked about the uh, weather in Charleston, but I know you're excited because we are counting down the days until the end of tropic season. Only a week left. So, what have you? Uh, what have you got for us tonight? Yeah, Scotty, uh, thanks for, for um, bringing that topic up. Yeah, we have eight days left to the end of the hurricane season 2017, which ends November the 30th in the Atlantic Basin. And uh, we are glad to see this season go. This is the official last day. It doesn't mean we won't see any tropical activity beyond that point or even into, into the middle or late winter. But uh, the chances diminish very greatly as far as the activity goes. And so um we're, we're looking forward to closing the season out we, next week i think we, we're going to have jim cantori want to wrap up the season with us on the carolina weather group so please join in and uh, bring any questions you may have we're going to cover a lot of different topics uh, including the accumulated accumulative cyclone energy uh for both the pacific and the atlantic so uh, that'll be an interesting topic to talk about but uh, i'll go ahead and share a screen let me know when you can see it we got you all right i'm going to present that to everyone Notice what we have going on, 7 p.m. update from the National Hurricane Center, no tropical activity for the next 48 hours. And if we look ahead, we have no tropical activity in the next five days. So that's a, a great thing. It looks like we're getting really close to finishing the season off with no activity. And uh, that's exactly how we'd like to end it. So we, we wanna just transition right into the winter time with the, the air temperatures and the climate just gets too cold to support it, including the water temperatures. Uh, eventually in time, the Gulf of Mexico and the uh, Caribbean will be the last ones to cool. But uh, we are looking forward to that. Here is the plume model for La Nina. We are in a La Nina right now, a weak La Nina. Uh, this happened, uh, was announced last week. And it looks like there's going to be a 65 to 75% chance that we're going to keep La Nina around till late winter. It could go beyond that. Uh, but the, this plume model definitely uh, suggests that Sea surface temps at minus 0.5 degrees Celsius below normal or or lower than that. Even the CFS, the INSEP CFS2 brings it down to almost a moderate to strong La Nina down here, the very bottom blue line. So we'll be watching that very closely. Uh, the Euro kind of missed its marks this year on uh, sea surface temps. In fact, if you remember back in the spring, we were talking about El Nino returning. Well, you know, sort of the opposite happened in the uh, Central Pacific, Equatorial Pacific cooled. So this is kind of the trend, below normal sea surface temperatures over there, which will drive the La Nina. For the southeast, that means we will have uh, above average temperatures and below normal rainfall. That's typically what it means. I, I wish I had brought that map out. Maybe I could show it for the end of the show. Uh, but I'll pass it back to you, Scotty, and we'll go from there. All right. Well, thank you for that update, uh, Shay. We appreciate that. We'll uh, also one more time to see if James, if James can hear us. James, do you have us? I got you now. All right, James. We're going to. Probably a bit of a delay, so I'll go ahead and talk because I think there's a few more. Thanksgiving Eve travel check in. Uh, you are looking, hopefully, at Interstate 85, just south of the North Carolina border into South Carolina here. And so, pavement is dry, the skies are clear, visibility is good. Uh, all right well we we appreciate that report james stay safe out there 
Uh, let us uh, know when you get to your destination safely. We appreciate the uh, traffic report. All right, Scotty, I've got uh, La Nina conditions here for the United States. Uh, projected, uh, this is sort of a projection of what, what kind of climate to expect. This is based on historical analysis of, of La Nina's in the past. Not every La Nina is the same, so we have to remember that. This is not exactly how it's going to play out. Uh, we could see variations in these temperatures and climate overall across the United States, but this is a general pattern. We have uh, the North Pacific High over to the west, which really drives uh, systems up and around and down into the northwest United States. So we could expect some southwesters to develop up there along the Aleutian Lows that drop down over Alaska. And then as we get down into the central United States across the central plains, we'll, we'll probably see a mix of weather through there. Depends on the subtropical jet coming up from the south as well as to how much moisture we'll see this winter. But you get a combination of these Arctic blasts from the north and moisture from the south. And we could have the northern tier uh, see some pretty um, pretty extensive snowfall. So that there's no real, I haven't seen any real modeling for that yet. It gets really tricky uh, when you start talking about 90 day modeling. But uh, you know, for, for pretty much the southern United States, we tend to see a drier pattern and a little bit warmer pattern as well. So that, that's sort of the, the visual that we have for La Nina since it was just announced last week. Back to you, Scotty. All right, and I think we got James a little bit better connection. James, can you hear us now? Mr. Briarton, can you, you got us. All right. All right, let's, let's toss it to Ricky. Ricky, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you go ahead with the interview and we'll see what we can do with James audio. All right, we'll, uh, we'll check in with James, hopefully driving quickly south as we know that's the only safe thing to do. Uh, anyway, let's bring in uh, Jamie from NWS-ish, kind of, sort of, maybe between two offices. Uh, Jamie, Used to work at the Weather Service in Blacksburg. I guess technically still does, right? And now you're transitioning to the Weather Service in the Carolinas. Yep, I'm joining the uh, the other side of the border here. So uh, thanks, Ricky. And uh, I've been lucky enough to know Ricky for quite some time. Do you remember which conference we met at, Ricky? Was it uh, NWA Atlanta or which which uh, conference was that? I had well, no, maybe it was Charleston, NWA in Charleston. I think oh, that had to be okay. Great. All right, maybe that, or a, I guess it would have been an AMS in Atlanta, right? I'm yeah. getting some of them mixed up. I know we crossed paths quite a bit, but um, well, first of all, thank you guys for having me. And yeah, my uh, the last few days has been pretty, uh, or at least the last week or so has been pretty uh, um, interesting. So I am currently on the books at the National Weather Service in Blacksburg. However, I did work my last shift uh, yesterday run together now so uh, yesterday in my first shift down at the National Weather Service in Raleigh North Carolina will be coming up on Tuesday of next week so I got a little bit of a break in between to get some of my uh, moving plans situated and uh, um, I'm looking forward to making the trip across the border and out of the mountains here uh, very shortly and I certainly won't miss I certainly will miss some aspects of the mountains but I'll tell you the uh, the wedge and trying to break that wedge uh, in the mountains was hard enough. I look forward to at least trying to figure it out east into the Piedmont County. Just add two days. Whatever you think it's going to be, add two days. <laughs> yeah, that's a good rule. <laughs> well, let's talk about a cool thing that I got to participate in. Uh, the Weather Service of Blacksburg and you and a few other office members hosted a media over the past couple of months to test out the AWIPS event simulator. Uh, you know, for you, people who may not know, AWIPS is the software the Weather Service uses to do a lot of forecasting, issue warnings, things like that. Uh, and we had the opportunity to kind of get a firsthand glance at what it's like to be on the warning desk in the event of severe weather. So talk to us a little bit about how that idea came up and why you guys wanted to do that program. Yeah, I can really attribute it, uh, and I apologize for not having my video. I'm getting some lag, so I thought I would at least try to cut down on some of the bandwidth here. Uh, so, um, like you mentioned, we decided uh, after some conversations with some management, uh, Phil Heisel is our warning coordination meteorologist there in the National Weather Service in Blacksburg, and he's the one that often reaches out to the media and uh, does our best to keep that connection strong. And we're really lucky in the Blacksburg office and I think many of our surrounding offices to have such a great relationship with the media. Because the one thing, at least in my opinion, and I think the opinion of many others, the Weather Service doesn't do very well, is communicate the weather message. It's something we're struggling with. I think we've come a long way um, over the past even year, uh, but certainly over the past five years, but there's a lot longer way to go. And that's why we're so lucky to have uh, core partners like the media folk 
um, like you, Ricky, and like many of the others that I've worked with, to actually uh, be that outlet, be the one that can communicate sometimes the obnoxiously um, overworded weather message into simpler terms, which often is portrayed a lot better by, uh, you know, even the parents, for instance, always talk to me like, what in the world does this mean? You just send it out. And I was like, oh, that's a, it's, it's interesting to realize that you didn't uh, see that message. So um, we definitely rely on the media uh, so much. And I, we thought uh, between Phil and I, uh, one way that we could really strengthen that relationship is to give the media a chance to sit behind the warning desk. Uh, we actually did a tour uh, two, uh, about a year ago to all of the um, the heavier media affiliates, the ones that have more than a few counties in our forecast area. I know, Ricky, we didn't get a chance to come visit you guys down at your station, uh, but we were able to tour about seven other stations to see what the media folks are able to, uh, what their side of the house entails and how they put together their forecast and their weather message. And we thought it would be a good time to invite um, those of to our office and actually see what goes on behind the warning desk in the hope that you can pick up on some of the little uh, things that we're putting together. You know, why is a polygon shaped a certain way? Uh, why was the wording this way? Or why did they put a tag in rather than upgrade it to a tornado warning? Uh, what is going on in the forecaster's mind? Because uh, I don't know what's going on in my mind half the time. So how can we expect you guys to know when a forecaster is switching out every other day? So hopefully it provided a nice window. And, and by the way, our door is always open if you want to stop by. We're uh, we're welcome to host. I appreciate you. it. Um, but so talk about how what we did may differ from what actually happens on a real day. Obviously, when, when Chris and I went to your office, it was you, me, and uh, Chris in, in a room with the AWIPS up, uh, warning the entire area per se. How would that differ from how it would be on a typical operations day? Right. Uh, we did the best that we could um, to try to give you guys the most realistic of experiences as you were going through the process. Uh, it, it's tough to do. Um, really, there's no recreating what actually goes on uh, when we're in warning operations mode. You know, it's often hectic. It's often unorganized, but we do our best to get the job done. And, and you really have to attribute that to the forecasters. We had a great office in Blacksburg that really gelled well together. Um, I hear great things about my new office in Raleigh, so I'm looking forward to kind of feeling my way into there as well. But it really is one of those things you need to experience firsthand. So we did the best that we could to mix a few things in. And uh, just to describe a little bit about the process that we went that went into these Media West exercises. The West is also, uh, by the way, a weather event simulation. Uh, so we tried our best to, and it's actually the same tool, um, the environment's the same tool that us as forecasters train on. Um, so we took you guys through that. We tried to give you a quick synopsis of what's going on in a real environment. You guys would have had several days or several hours at least leading up to the severe weather event. Um, but things start to unravel quickly. And as you can probably um, uh, dictate, Ricky, uh, there's you're all often um, obliterated with so many different data sources. It's actually overwhelming. So trying to find your niche um, on the data sources, what's useful in a certain scenario, what's not. Is really difficult and we guys we kind of threw you guys in the fire um, I would say the major differences were um, you guys were first of all we're not experienced we often go through a hundred and twenty plus hours of training uh, I have a friend out in the National Weather Service Service in Tucson who's going through it right now and her snap stories are, are my, <laughs> mighty depressing and they bring back some uh, great memories uh, great in quotation marks if my screen was actually working but um, 120 hours of modules online, and then they ship us out to Norman to actually go through simulations. So we unfortunately just threw you guys into the fire, and I'll tell you, we were really impressed with the media folks that went through uh, that, including you, Ricky, and, and Chris, who came along with you. Really impressed with how quickly quickly you guys caught up, caught on to it, because um, that is not an easy thing to do. So props to you there. Um, the one thing you didn't have was the support staff. Um, in an ideal situation, there would be several people in the office. Uh, during the more high impact events, you're talking about 10 plus. And you have people on social media, you have people on radar, you often have two to three people working radar, uh, whatever the event really calls for. Um, so I think you guys were really lacking the support staff. Otherwise, we tried our best to really give you the tools to make the decision on whether a warning should be issued or not. And let's set a baseline, I guess, so people may understand what event we were dealing with. Uh, we were talking about the 
February tornado outbreak from a couple of years ago. It's been three years ago now or so. Uh, tell us a little right. bit about that event and, and why that one was picked. Yeah, this event was a really unusual one. Uh, we actually had a debate in the office on whether or not we wanted to have you guys go through an event that was high impact and well known for at least many that went through it, or one that was maybe a more typical one here, at least in the Appalachians and uh, across the Carolinas, where it's it's not the classic supercells. It's not the you know the things that oh of course there should be a warning on that thing. Um, so we, we made a tough decision to do more on the high impact ones. So you guys could focus more on which type of warning should be issued, not whether a warning should be issued or not, because that's more that's easier to grasp, I would say, at least uh, without that uh, baseline training that we all have to go through. So uh, we, we did choose the February 2016 severe weather outbreak. And uh, we actually had a, it was a very unusual outbreak, first of all, because severe weather in February isn't all that common, but an EF3 tornado in February across the Piedmont of Virginia is also not very common. And we did have uh, another tornado that impacted a bit further south that day. So um, we thought it was a good event that really set the table for you guys. And um, I had a lot of good talking points. We were able to talk about some of the technologies that were used during that event or that are now available after that event that would have been helpful during that event. And um, I think it went really well. And so we had the opportunity to use uh, Warren Gin and AWIPS to issue our own warnings. Um, what did you find that broadcast meteorologists were kind of most shocked by when using the software? I would say the complexity. Um, it, while it is sort of intuitive, once you get clicking with it, it really takes quite a long time to to be comfortable. And, and like I said, unfortunately, you guys, we, the only choice we had was to throw you into the fire. Um, but there's so many shortcut keys or so many tips and tricks that, you know, wouldn't be in a handbook, but you kind of figure out over the years. Um, and that was really uh, is one of the tougher things. Otherwise, it's it's semi intuitive. Uh, it's really a few simple steps. You you make a decision in your mind. You draw a pretty box. You click go, and you click a couple options, and you go. But uh, as you can attest to, Ricky, uh, there's a lot of different thoughts throughout that process you have to go into, and you really don't have time to think about it. Uh, once you make that decision, uh, I, usually 60 seconds is too long to have the warning out because if a tornado is soon to touch uh, touch the ground, uh, and you guys are well aware of the types of tornadoes we get here, um, both in the western portions of the Carolinas and, and even just uh, east of the mountains there, you don't really have much more than 60 seconds with uh, the majority of our tornadoes. So um, being able to make that decision quickly and have the knobology to go through the event is is really critical. I think that was the hardest thing for us was – you know, obviously we didn't have the, this is happening right now, life or death kind of scenario that we would have on a real weather day. And so we were able to actually sit back a little bit more and think, huh, do I really want to issue this tornado warning? Or do I really want to issue only a severe thunderstorm warning instead of a tornado warning? Um, I think that was, you know, was something that kind of caught me at how much I was thinking about it. And I'm not sure if I would have been as conservative perhaps if it was a real weather event, uh, then I would have been on that day. But it also made me think about, if I'm issuing a tornado warning as a broadcaster, all the things that then get put into motion. I mean, severe thunderstorm warnings come out, you know, what, hundreds of times a year. Tornado right. warnings, at least in my market, come out maybe once or twice a year on a non-active mm -hmm. year. So, I mean, that's a big deal when a tornado warning comes out um, and all the stuff that goes along with that. So that was the thing, I guess, that caught me most by surprise. Chris and I actually, I guess we kind of cheated a little bit. We had to work with the weather service in Morristown before. So I was slightly familiar with Warren Gin and how warnings are issued through it um, mm -hmm. because we had got a chance to issue a few down there before. So I was like knowing how, a little bit how the interface works. Um, but right. it still was surprising, like you said, how 1950s almost it, it looks compared to some of the software is out there now. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And you're one of the rarities that have seen it before. We we had uh, several other stations come in completely blind, you know, trying to, to go through it. But, you know, we saw similar struggles, especially when it came to the decision making process. And that really shows, uh, at least to me, you know, where that thought process of mine can certainly be better portrayed. Um, right now, our text 
doc or text warnings may not do the trick. So using a program like NWS Chat to communicate with you guys, uh, the media folks and the emergency management partners that we have, uh, could go a long way saying, hey, I'm not issuing on this right now because of this, or hey, I decided to go with this warning because I see this. Um, that certainly is a good thing. Unfortunately, you know, you're balancing a weird time uh, workload type thing, you know, should I be communicating on NWS chat when there could be another short lived tornado touching down somewhere else I'm not paying attention to. And so those types of decisions have to come at the uh, at the office's discretion. So uh, luckily the weather service in Blacksburg, we've been increasing our presence on NWS chat. We have a great turnout from our media folks uh, um, in that chat room and we hope uh, we can continue to improve that relationship, especially on that program, but in general and in, into the future. And I know that's something the Weather Service in Norman has really hit on hard. Uh, we Rick Smith kind of almost dedicating himself to chat on high impact weather event days, just so there can kind of always be a voice in there from the Weather Service. And uh, you're not having to think about whether you can devote time to that right now or not. So is that yeah. something that maybe will be discussed at your office or has you think has been discussed at other offices? Uh, it's certainly a topic of conversation in our office, uh, at least the Blacksburg office. Um, unfortunately, you know, um, with the events, maybe in Norman, I think they they have a, a bit of a, a head start on us because typically, and not always, but typically their events are more strength or uh, straight cut. You know, well, that's a supercell, so you're going to get some impacts there. Where further east, we really struggle with identification of whether something's going to be severe and something severe today uh, didn't turn out the same signature wouldn't be severe tomorrow because the freezing levels at a different height or you're not getting the winds mixing to the surface. So I think more of our thoughts are going into the identification of the hazard versus being able to communicate that hazard. Because if we're struggling to identify it, it's a lot harder to communicate it. Um, so I think uh, a little for the Eastern offices specifically, and then often in the mountains, we tend to struggle more on that end where um, it, versus an outbreak in potentially Oklahoma, uh, Kansas area where there may be more clear cut, hey, this is a bad storm. Let's make a decision on whether it's tour versus severe. And I know that has other implications that go along with it. And I certainly um, uh, give them props for everything they do. But that's certainly an avenue that I hope we improve upon. Uh, I think it's going to take a buy-in on in the office, but also in the media folks. Uh, you know, try to communicate with us, and we we get some pushback both ways. You know, the office says we don't have, or people in my office may mention we don't have time to put that. I'm worried about the next warning, and then the media may not have time because they're live on air, and, and we certainly understand that. So, um, it's a push and shove type battle. Going back to to issuing the warnings, um, we had the opportunity to issue our own, as we discussed. Uh, and one of the things that caught me off guard was how finicky sometimes it can be trying to draw polygons or draw boxes. But also one of the neat things is how it kind of snaps to the county sometimes. It kind of keeps those boundaries uh, and the county warning area boundaries kind of intact. Um, did you find anything from the broadcasters that we issued bigger warnings or smaller warnings or anything like that? Well, the one thing that was interesting is, you know, each meteorologist in our office is different. Their philosophies are different. Um, they Some of it's because they've been trained at different times. Um, uh, and some of it's just a personal thought. You know, and that can go from how often a warning is issued. You know, my thresholds may be a lot higher or lower than uh, another forecaster's thresholds. And we saw that with the broadcast meteorologists. There's some more conservative while others are, hey, let's get the word out. And I really think there's there's validity in both aspects of that um when it comes to um uh, you know when it comes to the other aspects i really think it's just person to person and uh um it really was interesting and eye-opening to see that you guys uh were struggling you know with the same struggles and i don't think i quite answered your question can you repeat the second half uh, was there uh, you know did the media issue bigger or smaller warnings compared to forecast or you, you kind of answered it already but yeah, yeah, it, it was kind of a mixed bag. Some did, and some were much smaller. And uh, um, and it really showed that even with you know our intense training, and we still have differences. It was good to see that you guys also had differences. And uh, you mentioned some of the the positives, um, especially specifically the ones where you talked about county boundaries and how our warnings automatically snap to them. Those are definitely positives, but they can also turn into negatives. We get a lot of feedback sometimes: is why in the world did you shape your warning like that? 
well, look at the county boundary. And sometimes that's a, a valid thing because we're doing more of the county-based impacts and we're trying to get a new warning for the another county and you don't want to issue three warnings covering one county uh, or pieces of one county at the same time. Uh, but vice versa too. Uh, you uh, Polygon is shaped really well and you think that this is a very localized type thing, then maybe you want a smaller boundary um, at least or a smaller polygon. So. Um, it was interesting to see, but I think it was a mixed bag. You know, I, I wish uh, we could almost flip this around somehow and have you guys come one day. And uh, if there was ever a way we could set it up to where we can almost train like you guys do in this event simulator on the same way kind of a, a we would do in a TV studio. Oh. Uh, just so you can kind of see what we do on a warning basis, at least, right? and how we would communicate yeah. that. It'd be really cool if we could somehow set that up. I know they've tried that with facets and everything mm -hmm. out in Oklahoma with the hazardous weather test bed. Um, but th yeah. that's our next goal, I guess, is to set that up somehow. Oh, I think it would be fantastic. There's several people I would pay money to see in the green screen. So uh, let me know how we can make that happen. Cool. <laughs> Shay, did you have something? Yeah, Jamie, um, I wanted to ask you, um, as, far as, as far as your outreach goes, you know, I know that um, there's a lot of offices that are short staffed and we don't want to get into that that whole conversation about it. But uh, you mentioned the NWS chats and social media. Right. Uh, are you guys pushing more for and I've seen some offices actually pushing more the, the Periscope Live, which has a, a smoother algorithm to reach more people at one time. But uh, for like Facebook Live or, or any other outlets that the majority of folks are on, because we're, we're starting to see a shift in some of the demographics of who's watching what in which application they're watching it. And we know Facebook algorithm can be a little bit choppy. We don't quite reach the audience that we think that we're you know, organically reaching. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts on live streaming? Uh, I think uh, live streaming is a great way of doing things. I think we run into the same workload issue. Um, our office at the National Weather Service in Blacksburg, we, uh, we began these uh, weekly live stream events. We, we copied a lot of our media. Uh, in a way, we, we kind of stole from some of the media folks' idea of saying, hey, let's have a nightly or a weekly a weather update live stream on Facebook Live. And we did we tried that. We think we got some, unfortunately, it was quiet weather basically throughout the experience. And I think you can uh, uh, you can attest to it. During quiet weather, you tend not to get nearly the same amount of reach that it, versus if there was an S word mentioned in the forecast. So, um, you know, it was, it was tough to tell. We did four or five events. Uh, I think they ran smoothly. There's certainly some eye-opening things on uh, some of the struggles we run into, whether it's equipment or the ability to communicate. Um, but I, I think it's a valid source uh, of communication. It's just going to be one of those things where if we can't staff our forecasting desks, how are we going to be able to um, have enough people to go live? And what we found was you need two people and, you know, you're struggling to, um, as, as an office, you know, to get your normal shifts colored. Now you're asking two additional people to come in to try to uh, enhanced through communication. And right now we just don't have, I guess, the bang for the buck when it comes to uh, the live streaming and the social media type platforms that we would like to have. Yeah, and certainly understand, um, you know, that that's a, that's a tough thing to do. I know, uh, let's see, NWS Charleston was doing a few of those during severe events. And anything significant, they, of, of real significance, they would come on and, and talk about it. And some of the other NWS offices around the United States as well. But uh, it's, um, I, I know it's got to be tough for that. Uh, you know, that's, that's sort of what we like to do is we like to relay your information as it comes out. So we do the best that we can to relay official sources of information like yourselves and, and NOAA and Na National Hurricane Center. You said the S word is also the H word here for the coastline. Uh, yeah. and, you know, you, get, you start talking about a track uh, even at uh, 150 to 200 hours out and they bring it near your area and people's eyebrows get, you know, they get raised and, and everyone starts to look. Uh, so we, we just try to stick with the official information and relaying that and getting it out as, as much and as often as possible. So it's, um, you know, something we try to do for you guys as well. Yeah, and I think and that's extremely valuable for us. As I mentioned, we really struggle with the communication aspect. Um, we've slowly gotten better. I think a big step in the right direction was not having thing, everything yell at you. You know, we're slowly going to mixed case. It's uh, when, and in reality, I thought it should be a flip of the switch. It's become a little bit more uh, 
uh, harder than that. I know a lot of our LSRs, I think, are still coming out um, uh, poorly formatted and things like that. But we're slowly improving that aspect. Um, but that is really the value that the media folks in our market has really given us is the ability to communicate when we necessarily can't, or at least we can't do it in the best way possible. Um, one thing that I've been proud of is our social media networks. Um, unfortunately, we've had, we've run into the same hurdles that are out there, you know, Facebook's algorithm, you know, yeah, we have a great reach on Facebook. I think we're up to, you know, 30,000 uh, likes or, or something of that nature, and that, which is fantastic for us. Um, but you get a reach of 1,000. And you're like, oh, well, how's that going to be useful for us? So um, versus Twitter, where at least you know everything's going to be in the same timeline and someone isn't going to comment on your tornado warning from last year, whether or not they're in the in the path of it. And so we've really come into some issues there. I think it's going to uh, continue to be one of those feel-out process, the weather service-wide. Um, but I think you're right. Trying to put the information on as many platforms as possible and make that information relevant and easily accessible is going to be key uh, as for the weather service going forward. Two words. Cat Very cool. Videos. <laughs> Jared, our, um, our, our guru, Jared, uh, me and him, we've, we've um, installed AWIPS 2 to our computer systems. Mine didn't fare so well on PC system, but Jared's managed to get it working on OS our Apple OS and uh, Linux. I think he's running this on Linux. I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. uh, he's got he's got a whips up on his screen here. It looks like, and he's drawing a polygon. So it's similar to what you guys have. Uh, of course, the weather service product is is you know has major differences in what we would get in the public. But uh, if you want to briefly talk about a whips and, and how the software works, and maybe how your successes or, or uh, struggles with it. Yeah, yeah, um, that looks very similar. Um, obviously, I think we have some more bells and whistles, and a lot of that can often be, uh, oh, wow, look, you even have like a warning type thing up there. That's pretty cool. It's a test, uh, I swear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was going to say, your ability to disseminate that would be interesting. Uh, that's a threshold you don't want to cross necessarily. <laughs> but, uh, did you hack into the National Weather Service again? We told you. Uh, you know, just a you know, just a, just a fun evening in the park. Now, so so <laughs> Unidata, uh, they they do this for for colleges, and they they provide um, the full AWIPS too, basically. Like, if I was really enterprising and fire this up on my Linux machine, I probably could get GFE if it wouldn't crash. Mm. Um, wow. it, it, AWIPS 2 is notorious for, for its crashes, but it does give you a practice mode warn gen, which is uh, pretty interesting. And one thing I was wondering um, is it, the weather event simulator, is, is this something that might end up in a university setting? Is this something that, uh, that you might see in college programs as you train new forecasters? Uh, ideally, yes. Uh, unfortunately, our ability to give these out is very limited. Um, I was lucky enough to have a management staff that would say, hey, if, as long as you can work out the scheduling and do all that stuff, go for it. And uh, Phil was often, uh, Phil Heisel and our Sue, uh, Steve Caton, um, they were often involved with the process when they could be, but certainly not every aspect. Um, so I think this would be a great thing uh, to potentially have in the college uh, field. But, you know, we are right now the only weather organization that uses the software. So you could go through a whole semester learning it and decide the weather service isn't for you. And, and we actually have student volunteers that do that. And they decide, you know, by week three, after working with me two or three shifts, they're like, this is not for me. And I take a little offense, but otherwise, you know, <laughs> it's understandable. And it's certainly not for everybody. And um, But I think it would be a valuable thing uh, ultimately to have. And that's why I would recommend student out there, you know, certainly communicate with your National Weather Service office. Even if you're still in high school, stop by and see if they have any sort of program a lot of times, especially if you're not co-located with the university, weather service offices don't know there's interest. Um, you, we don't have internships necessarily give out. It takes a local program to get going, and we've been lucky enough to have one at our office here in Blacksburg um, with Virginia Tech being so close by. But not every office has that uh, luxury. So to approach your office, say, hey, I'm interested in helping you out somehow. This is what I can do or this is what I'm – interested in learning about and I think it can go a long way in your personal and educational career. And Jared, um, you actually can, I know, do simulations to a degree with that. Uh, Warren Petty back at UNC Charlotte got some stuff working and he's been working on getting some event simulations and things like that, at least when he was back at UNCC. Um, it, it's a little cumbersome because of AWIPS and all the issues that mm -hmm. come with that every once in a while, um, but it can be done, I know. 
it's just uh, data wise and, and operation wise and a bunch of other stuff uh, wise. Yeah. It, it can be tricky every once in a while. So I, I've looked into running my own edX server, and it is a, not an easy feat to put it mildly. Um, the data retention requirements are huge. Uh, you need big beefy hardware, um, but <clears throat> you can create archive ca archive cases with it and stuff. It, it's pretty cool. Um, it, it's a it, it's quite a bit of fun. So. Yeah. Am I, well, Jared, when you get that am I share server up and running, let me know, and we'll all plug in. <laughs> hey, can you guys I, see my screen right now? Got your own screen, yes, sir. Awesome. All right. So uh, the NSSL, and I haven't dabbled in this in, in probably a year or two, but the NSSL, which is uh, uh, one aspect of the NOAA National Weather Service structure, um, they actually have this hot seat simulator, which uh, it certainly isn't an AWIPS 2 environment, but it's almost like a, a, a rundown replica. Um, it's currently in beta, but if you uh, go to this website, and I can certainly uh, send this to you guys uh, at the end of this call or post it in this chat, but if you guys are able to go to the NSSL website or just Google search a hot seat warning simulator, um, that is a good way for you to try it out at home with really no extra bells and whistles. Um, you should be able to do it on most PCs, and um, I'd imagine they even have a Mac version. So up oh, here you go. Um, looks like, yeah, most... It looks it looks like it just requires a browser and it looks like most of the big uh, browsers are are in it so uh, give it a shot uh, give it a check out and and that may be ooh cascade ah, how do I get that off Warp um, speed. okay <laughs> um, so uh, uh, it, it's certainly worth looking at especially if you're at home and you may not have access to a Linux system which is what we run our AWIPS 2 off of all right well any other questions about this uh, I want to transition over to some tornadoes we had with uh, Tropical Depression Nate uh, a little while back, if no one else has any more questions. Take that silence as a no. All righty. Well, let's talk about those tornadoes, uh, James, because they were interesting not only for Scotty in uh, southwestern North Carolina, but also for you guys in the Blacksburg CWA, because it was the first tornado in quite a while for parts of the uh, North Carolina high country. Right. No, you're exactly right. We've actually had a really active October, uh, that secondary tornado season. Uh, thanks a lot to the tropical uh, season that we've seen, but also um, just it just tends to tick it back up. You know, you either have a bad fall fire season or you tend to have a bad severe uh, season. It almost kind of alternates back and forth, at least in um, the Appalachian type region. So, uh, yeah, you, as you mentioned, we did have a tornado occur on October 8th. Uh, we also had a uh, three, at least in our forecast area, occur on the 23rd from a cold front. But the one you were referring to was the from Nate. And uh, it was actually one um, that occurred as I was heading south and east into the Carolinas for a quick vacation. So unfortunately, I wasn't there working the event, but I did follow from afar. And uh, I, GSP certainly was busy. And we kind of cleaned things up as the tornado streaks through portions of, or the tornadic thunderstorm streaked through portions of uh, Wilkes County and into ash. And it actually is ash's first recorded tornado since 1950 records began uh, here in the Weather Service. So uh, it was certainly an October to remember. And Jamie, to kind of piggyback off that, uh, not only was October busy, uh, but forgive me if I'm wrong, but May was pretty busy for your forecast area as well. I mean, it, that was another uptick in tornadoes. Yeah, this spring was a very busy season, and it also had some unusual aspects in the realm of the timing of the tornadoes. We had several tornadoes um, hit um, while there was a wedge in place or, or a breaking wedge, which isn't too unusual. It's something that has occurred a lot in the last few years that I've noticed. But um, but they often they also occurred really early in the morning. We're talking, you know, two, three, four a.m. and uh, uh, talk about, you know, trying to be on your best forecasting behavior. You know, you've been there since some of us were there since 8 p.m. And then all of a sudden here's 3 a.m. and things are starting to let loose. And, you know, anybody's going to be tired. So props to my coworkers who was really battling um, to keep an eye on those things. And um, it, we've really seen and it's not technic it's not really unusual, but we've really seen those low end, low top tornadoes this year. Um, seems like that's been commonplace, not only in our forecast area, but further south. And uh, boy, you know, with the radar beams so high, uh, really anywhere you look when it comes to mountains, those are tough to detect. And uh, you saw some struggles there this year, and I think it's not an uncommon thing. And in the, in the future, you're going to see similar type events. 
Yeah, we are uh, definitely wanting a radar somewhere here in, in the western part of North Carolina. That would really help out. But again, like you were talking about, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think it was the Eden area of, uh, of the northwest Piedmont just up north of Greensboro. Mm -hmm. Those were some pretty damaging tornadoes as well. If I'm not mistaken, the downtown area got hit pretty hard. Yeah, we, we or I often refer to them tornadoes with eyes, where it certainly wasn't necessarily an intense tornado, but boy, it found the city center. <laughs> so obviously they're going to draw some high, uh, some eyeballs and some media attention, and, and rightfully so. I mean, these are not necessarily rare events, but these are, I mean, when it comes to the other types of thunderstorm and weather-related incidents, these are certainly ones that people like to talk about, and those are certainly ones we don't see all that often. So, uh, yeah, Eden was a prime example. Uh, we also had uh, one in October. Um, this was the cold front that came through. Uh, we had that one storm that basically produced tornadoes from as far south as GSP, and it continued on that north to even slightly northwest trajectory into uh, the New River Valley of Virginia, uh, which was just incredible to watch. And um, and it was one of the more unusual um, circumstances when it comes to the damage. I was actually down in Wilkes County right there by Wilkesboro when that one touched down. And we were seeing damage, you know, six miles wide. And you're sitting there like, there's no way this, I mean, but it wasn't continuous. You know, there's no way this was a six mile wide tornado. I mean, you're not going to see that uh, hopefully anywhere. Um, so what type of, uh, you know, where do we start this path? And you get damage over here, there, that might be RFD. It might be a... Uh, you know, inflow damage. It was just the one of the weirdest, and I've, I haven't been on many, but one of the strangest damage surveys I've been on. And I know GSP, uh, they were busy for three, four, five days, and they were seeing a lot of similarities that we were. Yeah, um, in fact, um, the first, the October 8th, Ricky and I was at the Speedway, uh, but I was able, it, it actually went through my forecast area here in the western part of the state. So I was able to go uh, on the damage survey through three or four counties with GSP, the 23rd event, I was like you was out of town on vacation and watching from afar. But uh, my, I guess my last question with the uh, with the tornadoes, and then I'll give it back to Ricky, is uh, I was able to go on the damage survey. Like you said, you see all this kind of damage. But for those folks who um, who here on the on the news stations or on Facebook or anything like that, uh, they're they're saying a, the weather service is is doing a damage survey. What exactly are you guys looking for? I know, but we know. But what does the general public? What do they need to know? What you're looking for on a damage survey, and what the purpose of of them are? Yeah, so we do our best to document uh, any type of weather um, impacts that occur because of certain events. So, for instance. Um, you know, if a squall line came through and produced wind damage, we try to document based on reports from both the media partners, the public, anybody that will send us reports, we do our best to document those and enter them into a storm data publication, which is archived uh, by the Weather Service and used all across the agency and also all across um, you know, insurance companies, everybody kind of accesses that. Um, the tornado events in particular are really damaging events and very finite, short, often short-lived, but very small areas. And so for those, we actually send a team into the field to conduct a damage survey, like you said. And uh, during those surveys, it often varies by event. For instance, this event, we were searching left and right. We were zigzagging across the uh, somewhat sparse road network of Wilkes County, trying to figure out where the swath was because there wasn't a clear swath. Um, and we actually did find that there, it was intermittent type damage, at least from the border, uh, our forecast area border, the border of Wilkes there, um, north until about Wilkesboro when you saw some more impressive damage, EF1 type damage that continued north. And uh, you're really trying to look for the tall tale signs because often tornado damage is mistaken uh, or vice versa of straight line wind damage and often they occur in the same storm so trying to pick out all right this is where the tornado impacted and this is where more of a straight line wind event um was um or actually impacted versus you know the the finite um wind pattern of a tornado so uh, we do our best to look at all the damage or as much damage as we can uh, connect the dots to see if it's more tornadic or if it's more straight line wind. And, and we enter that into the publications, which is used across the world. All righty. Well, uh, we're getting closer to, well, we're past nine o'clock. We'll go to nine fifteen tonight. Um, talk, let's just chat a little bit about North Carolina real quick. Anything you're looking forward to coming down to Raleigh? Oh, uh, I'm looking forward to getting out of uh, the, the mountain forecasting because, 
boy, I don't think I've ever had grids where, you know, one pixel apart and it's 15 degrees apart for a high or a low. And isn't that fun? You know, oh, yeah. you bust high or low and either way you're going to be 10 degrees off. So uh, I am looking forward to seeing more of a stable weather pattern. Uh, I'm a severe weather buff. So being able to do more radar forecasting, um, certainly personally, I'm looking forward to. Um, but also I hear great things about the area. Uh, we have a family home uh, in New Bern, which is uh, actually in the Newport Weather Service offices, DMA. But um, so I'm familiar at least with the Tidewater portions of North Carolina. I'm looking to to get to know uh, the Raleigh area and uh, I hear great things about it. Do you guys have any advice for me as I uh, transition down there next week? If you like barbecue, like bar bar like bar 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 go to the pit. It's in downtown. It's a great place. <laughs> okay. I'm putting it on my list. I appreciate and that. The, if you like banana pudding, it is the best banana pudding I've ever had in my entire life. So. Oh, that's awesome. Maybe there'll be a show sponsor next week. <laughs> hey, maybe, we, maybe we can do that. Take some Nate, Nate, Nate awesome. Johnson to uh, knock on your door about two days after you get there and be like, hi, I'm Nate. Uh, <laughs> that may happen. And, yeah, but uh, I'm heard he's uh, relocating at some point. No, he's staying down in Raleigh. He's just got a new job. So. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. I, I thought he was maybe the new gig was going to take him away, but I'll, I might knock on his door if I don't hear from him here soon. <laughs> and, and, uh, no pressure. You only have Greg Fischel in your market. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and do not go around the Crab Street Mall during heavy rain events. That place always floods. <laughs> always. Like Boone, huh? Very similar to the Boone, it seems like then, yeah. <laughs> Um, I heard there's a uh, there's a, a certain restaurant in that mall I have to uh, to visit. I can't recall. I think it's what is a, one of those Chinese restaurants. Oh gosh, I can't. Uh, but I I hear as long as there's no rain in the forecast, you can check it out. So I appreciate that advice. Yeah, and their interstates to me are confusing. But besides that, uh, Raleigh's a pretty good place. A lot of outdoor activities. Uh, you got sporting events. I know you're a, a sports guy. So. Uh, yep. Oh yeah. So uh, when Virginia Tech Hokies come down, I see you have a Duke Blue Devil. So how does that work out? Oh yeah, can you see that back there? I was <laughs> to, uh, so I'm a I, I've been a Duke uh, Duke basketball fan for for years, uh, actually since I was really young. Um, so I followed their basketball team well before I decided to become a Hokie. And um, you know, a couple games a year, it's really tough. I usually cheer for the winning team, <laughs> but uh, other than that, uh, I tend to pull for Virginia Tech athletics with the exception of basketball. I may lean a little bit more blue. So, oh, I guess with me going to Raleigh, I have to dictate Duke blue, not UNC blue, not puke blue. So. Right. <laughs> There's several shades of blue here in North Carolina. So There is, and, and I look forward to seeing all that merchandise all next to each other in the Walmarts when I get there. <laughs> You're right. One thing, uh, I we're talking about sports, whatever. On my bucket list is to go to a football game at Lane Stadium because I just think that just watching on TV, that environment is so electric. I can only imagine what it's like being there in person. Oh, it, it is like nothing else. Um, if you guys don't know what we're talking about, just do a quick Google search of Lane Stadium, Enter Sandman, and you will for hours just be able to see students off their rockers enjoying and uh, – and even in the basketball stadium, you know, the entrances are kind of, uh, but if you get a team like Duke in there and there's a potential upset and that thing comes on, you know, that uh, Richter or the uh, seism seismograph is, is rocking in Blacksburg again. And that's, that's also kind of a cool feature uh, how we're able to uh, influence some of the earth's crust with our, uh, our loudness. So that's good stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all I've got. Scotty, is it uh, you want to end with Tweets of the Week here? Yeah, we can do Tweets of the Week. So uh, I've got mine pulled up. I've actually got two. I've got a funny one that I want to do first. Um, it just has to deal with the uh, the Marta bus blocking the weather channels. Shot. Jamie, you're welcome to join in here. Or James, you're welcome to uh, jump in here too if you want. All right, appreciate it. James, actually. So this is from uh, Storm Chaser Nick. And his uh, Marta bus is blocking those crazy snowfall graphics that we like to see. So that was the, that was the funny one that I've seen. But one that uh, – and just scroll through me with Twitter for just a second. One that really caught my attention was this one right here. This is what I will say my tweet of the week is. This is actually from Shay in uh, Jared's region, so I hope I didn't steal theirs. But uh, this was talking about 11 years ago that Charleston and Savannah saw their earliest snowfall on record. 
uh, back in 2006. So uh, pretty interesting read. You could go over and check out uh, National Weather Service, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. They have like a little write-up on it. So uh, that will be my tweet of the week um, 11 years ago today, or yesterday actually, um, was the earliest snowfall on record. So that'll be mine. So uh, who wants to go? I think Ricky's got his pulled up. So Ricky, I'll let you go. Yeah, uh, some of you guys may know Weather Underground is discontinuing, can discontinuing, if I can spit out that word, their webcam services, uh, which sucks for us in the broadcast sector uh, because we like to look at a lot of those, especially on Northwest Flow snow days. So Jesse Farrell from uh, AccuWeather has come up with seven alternatives, places you can host your webcam images if you want to. He's got a nice blog there about uh, some places you can put your camera instead of weather underground they're discontinuing that on the 15th so sad to see that go but uh hopefully maybe we can get a lot of those cameras back online yeah Very interesting. i saw a tweet today from sakura which is a southeast cooperative uh and they're working on a webcam sort of a new initiative to get webcams out uh, over the water and over areas uh for all kinds of reasons all kinds of purposes marine life current sea surface currents um maybe even search and rescue. I mean, you name it, they're, they're, um, they're coordinating an effort now. So hopefully we'll start to see some headway on that uh, coastal zones. All right, let's go to uh, Jared Smith and Charleston. Jared, I'll let you uh, do your tweet of the week. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so for those of you in South Carolina, you might know Chris Jackson. He uh, runs the South Carolina Weather Facebook page. He works very closely with the National Weather Service in Columbia. And I thought that this was really cool. Uh, he has been at the fire department. You know, he's a firefighter. Uh, he has left the fire department and he's doing uh, distance learning and meteorology. He's pursuing his passion, um, which is just uh, really awesome. You know, I've gotten to know him a little bit over the years and doing the weather Twitter thing. And uh, he's uh, got a really good head on his shoulders. I think he's going to be great at this. So uh, Chris, best of luck to you. Congratulations on, uh, you know, a gutsy move. Um, and uh, and I can't wait to see uh, what kind of contributions, additional contributions he can make to the field. I agree with you, Jared. Yeah, um, talked to him the other day and he, he was like, you know, asking, you know, what, what, what sort of things do I need to look forward to? And I said, look, man, if you're chasing your passion, it'll it'll all work out. I'm telling you, you're going to enjoy it. You're going to really love it. That's true. Congratulations, Chris. Good job. And uh, maybe uh, you can let us know how your progress goes. So, Shay, I'll, uh, the camera's on you, so I'll let you go ahead and share your tweet of the week. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. Now that we have Go16, let me present that to everybody. Here we go. Um, Whoops, let me go back to this one. The NOAA satellites, GO-16, now has spectacular image of the North Atlantic. And this is a mid-latitude, I'm sorry, mid-latitude cyclone, which these are known to get up to even hurricane force winds in some of these. These are upper lows that develop over cooler zones. We see them a lot in the North Pacific and North Atlantic. But just to, just to give you an idea of some of the imagery we're going to start seeing from, from GO-16 in the northern sector of the Atlantic, very exciting stuff. Uh, just one of, of many, many uh, views to come. I think when we, once we get the polar orbiter in place, uh, we'll start to see even more data coming. So uh, very exciting stuff. That's, that's my tweet of the week. I thought that was fascinating because normally we only get this kind of imagery with uh, North Pacific from Himawari, or maybe we catch that Northwestern sector off of the GOES, uh, off the GOES satellite, GOES East, uh, or the GOES, I'm sorry, the GOES West. <laughs> but uh, anyways, back to you, Scotty. Very cool. And just for those who uh, have been tuning in over the past couple of weeks, JPSS-1 finally did get up and uh, did get launched. So i uh, waiting for uh, all the data to start feeding in here in the next few months. So uh, that was uh, a bit of a relief as it, it uh, the, the launch was scrubbed a few times for various reasons, but it is finally uh, into uh, orbit. So with that, let's go to Peter. And Peter, do you have your tweet of the week tonight? I do, and I almost had a heart attack when Shay was on the NOAA satellites page. Uh, today, uh, we uh, NOAA satellites is remembering John F. K. Uh, because in 1961, he asked Congress to provide funds for the first ever satellite system for the worldwide weather observation. And that eventually led to the fund for NOAA and uh, all the good stuff we have today, like GO-16. So uh, I guess we could thank JFK for that. And all those great people in Congress and NOAA and whatever that provide us all that great weather information and satellites and radars and all that good stuff we have today. Very cool. Scotty. All right. Thank you for that, Peter. And uh, let's go to Jamie. Jamie, do you have uh, a tweet? 
Yeah, yeah. So I would certainly recommend anybody out there, uh, even outside of the Carolinas or inside, um, certainly make sure you're following your local National Weather Service office. Uh, most have become active on Twitter. And if they're not as active as you'd like, send them a tweet and let them know. A lot of them just need that right push. Uh, so I'm going to showcase one of my last balloon launches here. Um, our office is lucky enough to have that relationship with Virginia Tech Meteorology. And I actually had five student volunteers uh, and a few capstone participants or future capstone participants um, help me out with one of my last launches. So um, I'm very appreciative of uh, the students and the relationships. And that's really the, the same program that got me into the weather service. So I can't talk enough about it. And shout out to Robert Stonefield, a uh, meteorologist at that office, who's really put his blood, sweat and tears into making that program so great. Um, so I'll leave you guys with that. And if you would just allow me one more tweet, I just want to thank that office um, for really everything. And the next uh, time they see me will be likely on collaboration as we will remain backup offices. Um, and I'll be backing or have the ability to back up Blacksburg um, and they'll be backing me up in, in Raleigh. And I look forward um, uh, to my new adventures. And I certainly look back with fondness on such a great office there um, in Blacksburg. But you know, uh, Jimmy, than, that, that's a very interesting situation because a lot of times backup offices can be halfway across the uh halfway across the the states with you let's say they ever had to back up blacksburg and you're in raleigh you almost have an in and knowing all the local ems knowing all that stuff that kind of goes on in a daily operation there in blacksburg that, that's really an interesting point and a, one that could almost be used to your advantage yeah, no, it's definitely a benefit. Uh, I'll likely walk in the door and immediately have uh, something assigned to me as the, as the backup coordinator or whatever. But uh, I think it's definitely an advantage to have. And what we try to do as often as possible is share forecasters, at least uh, allow forecasters to, to visit each office, to have an understanding of some of the basics that go through it. And it's a complicated uh, backup procedure. Uh, but it's one that we found crucial within the weather service this past year, especially with all the tropical activity. Uh, you saw San Juan go down for several weeks. We actually had our hydrologist go to who used to be uh, in San Juan, go down to Miami to help with that backup process. And we saw so many great uh, stories of offices backing other offices up. And um, it, it's, it's going to be a theme of the future. As weather events continue, we're going to really need to help each office out. Very cool. Well, Jamie, um, while you're at it, while you're on Twitter, uh, if you want to share uh, how our folks can get in touch with you or maybe uh, the Weather Office uh, Twitter account as well. Yeah, so uh, the Weather Ser or the Weather Service Office Twitter account um, for Blacksburg is at NWS Blacksburg. For Raleigh, it's at NWS Raleigh. And my personal one is at WX Bone, so W-X-B-O-N-E. Um, feel free to follow, and uh, I'll usually be tweeting about Hokies, weather, uh, the Capitals, or or the Steelers. So if you're interested in any of those four, you know, feel free to give me a follow, and and I'll certainly try to follow you back. Sounds like my Twitter page. It's nothing but weather and sports. So there you go. There you go, Scotty. I got I got one more for you here, real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Everybody's got to tune into this guy on November the 25th. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, my cues. He's gonna, you know, fly in a rocket about 1.5 kilometers over the over the, the top of the ground, uh, in a homemade rocket to pr prove that the Earth is flat. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that's gonna be done, but uh, uh, it's supposed to be uh, broadcast on YouTube. It doesn't want people around because it could be an unsafe area um, <laughs> with a rocket going up. Um, let's see, 1.5 kilometers at a speed of roughly 800 kilometers per hour. That's about 500 miles per hour. So I don't know how uh, he's <laughs> going to stay uh, conscious for this, but it, it should be interesting to see how this whole thing <laughs> works out. But I just wanted to point that out real quick. This November 25th, put on your radar to tune in and see if this thing actually happens or not. He used a term called Atmos flat, which is not a real word, by the way, but um, kind of a bizarre story developing the last day or so. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> I think Ricky's actually got some footage from from what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Does he have yeah. a contingency plan for if he goes off the edge? <laughs> so it reminds me of that Jackass movie where he went up in the rocket uh, over the water, <laughs> and the first time it it blew up on him like the rock the the, <laughs> the fuselage blew out of the sides of it and almost killed him. 
Uh, well, I'm well, sure. we'll see what happens there. Thanks, Ricky, for the <laughs> <laughs> He's All a right. rocket man. Uh, well, I hate that James missed that. He would have had some fun with that. But uh, thanks, everyone, for watching the Carolina Weather Group tonight. I do want to mention – uh, Shay talked about a little bit earlier in our show. Shay, do you want to kind of preview what uh, next week's all about one last time? Yes, uh, Jim Cantore will be joining us for the wrap-up of the hurricane season 2017. We'll talk about some of the significant major hurricanes we had. Uh, we had two Category 5 landfalls, one Category 4 landfall. That was Harvey in Texas. So we've got a lot to talk about there. And also the accumulated cyclone energy, which was lower in the Pacific but higher in the Atlantic. Uh, so there's there's a couple of things we'll we'll talk about with Jim next week, and uh, we'll just sort of let him drive that boat and uh, do do what he does best and talk weather and uh, geek out with us. So tune in next week with us. Are we at an earlier time, Shay? Do we know that? Have we confirmed? Oh that? yes, that's a good point. Uh, I think we're going to start at seven p.m. next week versus eight fifteen. Jim's got a he's got a rather tight schedule, so he's carving out some time for us. We want to go. Uh, we want to sort of, uh, uh, you know, accommodate him in the best way possible. So 7 p.m. next week. 7 p.m. next week. And I think, Peter, you and James are tag teaming, right? Uh, I'm not saying. <laughs> okay. We'll leave it a mystery for next week. A mystery. All right. Well, everyone, thank you for joining us tonight on the Carolina Weather Group. Uh, we do hope you and your family have a, a good and safe uh, Thanksgiving and uh, stay warm this weekend as it looks like we're going to cool off. So uh, until next week, don't eat too much turkey, and we'll, uh, we'll see you next weekend. Have a great one.